Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be today. Welcome to our uh, 12th uh, dialogue session of this series entitled Specters of Crisis, Rays of Hope. Uh, this is uh, the, final of, uh, the final session of the series, which started in July, um, and whose purpose was to um, keep us uh, talking under these um, uh, adverse circumstances, keep us abreast of the situations uh, in various parts of the world as they have been evolving, and um, uh, maintain a, an ongoing uh, reflection um, of, uh, around the, on the crisis as uh, this has been uh, deepening. Uh, this, uh, today's topic uh, is um, on COVID-19 and insights from agrarian south. It is um, a, a, a topic which uh, looks, uh, 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 it tends to bring it all together in a certain sense and also uh, launch our research bulletin, which was part of our initiatives uh, throughout these last six months. Uh, beyond the, the dialogue series, we have had uh, a research bulletin, which was launched in September. Uh, this is a monthly research bulletin. We will do a launch today. We have also had, along with the dialogue series and the research bulletin, a special section in our journal, Agrarian South, which will appear for the first time this month in December and will continue as a special section throughout uh, next year. So um, our Specters of Crisis, Rays of Hope uh, initiative has been uh, quite a robust uh, effort on, uh, uh, by various means to uh, maintain a debate a, and a rigorous analysis of the pandemic crisis, of the economic crisis, and a whole range of other uh, uh, crises that, are, that have been deepening um, recently. So, um, the our speaker, our key speaker today is Dr. Lino Some, um, and our discussant is Professor Praveen Jha. I will soon introduce both. The just to uh, remind our, our our viewers that uh, this is an initiative of the Agrarian South Network in association with uh, uh, Court Partners, the Samoa African Institute for Agrarian Studies in Zimbabwe and Action Aid uh, in, in India. Um, together with uh, supporting partners uh, that include the Center for Informal Sector and Labor Studies at JNU in India, the Institute of African Studies at the University of Ghana, the Global University for Sustainability in Hong Kong, China, and the Federal University of ABC, uh, in, uh, in, in Brazil, uh, which includes um, a collaboration between the postgraduate program in world political economy, the educational technologies and languages unit, and the office of the provost of, for research, uh, for outreach and culture. The, these sessions uh, have um, taken place in English. Um, you can send your questions uh, on Zoom or Facebook um, either in English or any other language which, with which you feel comfortable, and our team will uh, translate it, translate your questions and, and, and forward them to us. Uh, uh, these. Uh, you can write your questions on, on um, the Zoom or the Facebook uh, page. Um, and these uh, sessions are being recorded and are being translated in uh, Portuguese in Spanish and the full set of uh, translated uh, recordings will be released uh, soon and will be made available on our websites. The, so without further ado, uh, I will introduce uh, Dr. Lino Some and Praveen Jha and uh, we will continue then with a launch of the research bulletin and uh, then um, uh, Lin's own thoughts on uh, uh, where this, all this has taken us over the last few months. So Linus Spome is a senior research fellow at the Macquarie Institute for Social Research at Macquarie University in Kampala, where she teaches politics and feminist political economy. 
She's the author, most recently, of Gender, Ethnicity, and Violence in Kenya's Transition to Democracy, um, and uh, is co-editor of the forthcoming uh, volume, Labor Questions in the Global South, together with uh, Praveen Jha and Walter uh, Chambati. She's an associate, associate editor of Agrarian South, co-editor of the Journal of Contemporary African Studies, and serves on several boards, uh, including uh, CODESRIA, the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa, and the International Association for Feminist Economics. He's a long-term member of our agrarian center. Uh, Praveen Jha is Professor of Economics at the Center for Economic Studies and Planning, uh, and also adjunct professor at the Center for Informal Sector and Labor Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. He has published widely on labor and agrarian relations, uh, the economics of education and public finance. His uh, most recent uh, publications include uh, the, the co-edited uh, volume with Lynn on labor questions in the global south. There's also, this, this will come out uh, soon in 2021. There's also uh, another uh, co-edited volume which will come out next year as well on global agricultural value systems, co-edited as well with um, uh, Walter Chambati, Frida Maswi, myself. Um, there's also the Rethinking the Social Sciences with Sam Moyle, which we co-edited in 2020, and Reclaiming Africa, Scramble and Resistance in the 21st Century, which came out in 2019. Um, so it's been a couple of uh, very active uh, years. Um, uh, and I will not go down the list of the years preceding this, but um, uh, suffice it to say that uh, Praveen Jha uh, is indeed a pillar of South-South collaboration and uh, of uh, the setting of the research agenda on a global level. Um, um, without further ado, I will pass um, the microphone over to so that we can uh, begin uh, with the launch of the research bulletin. And um, I will ask also our, our, our team, our uh, logistics team, uh, Joseph, to uh, soon put on the uh, show, the, share the screen, um, share the, 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 the research bulletin on the screen. So Lynn, it's, all, it's, uh, it's, it's up to you. Okay. Thank you, Paris, and uh, thanks, thanks everyone who, who has taken time to, to join us for this launch. Uh, as Paris said, the, you know, the, this, uh, the, the research bulletin was one of a number of initiatives that the Agrarian South Network embarked on this year, uh, you know, partly to understand what was happening in the world and especially the agrarian south during this uh, pandemic period. And the bulletin itself, the aim of the bulletin itself was to bring together, uh, at least it was envisioned as a, a forum that could bring together short, concise pieces of analysis that were both theoretical, uh, theoretical analytical, many of them, uh, you know, uh, presented raw empirical data, and uh, and these insights would be from Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Um, uh, so we have tried uh, to maintain the continental balance over the uh, you know the first issue appeared in September. I think you see them on the screen. Uh, then the second issue was October and the, the latest issue is, is November. Uh, and in each we have tried to maintain a, the regional balance, balance on account of gender uh, and so on. It's not always easy, um, but uh, you know, also in terms of, uh, uh, you know, th because of thematic coherence, uh, it's not always easy, but we have uh, managed. Um, in this uh, effort, I wasn't alone. 
I would like to acknowledge the, the very serious and very consistent work put in by my comrades in the editorial uh, board, uh, uh, Manish Kumar, Damien Lobos and Freedom Mazui, who I think are all here, or I hope are, are all here. Um, and our hope is to continue this, the, uh, this forum. It has found quite a bit of circulation. It's not an alternative to the journal, but it allows, uh, I, I think in a way that the restrictions you know, the, the sort of intellectual policing that sometimes uh, constrict journals does not find its way here. So we have found uh, people able to speak passionately uh, and, you know, make uh, arguments that are not only polemical, but are serious in terms of what we are trying to do, uh, what we are trying to achieve. So as a space, it has been very productive. And we hope that, you know, uh, to see, especially younger scholars, um, you know, putting in contributions in the coming months. Uh, uh, Paris has to tell us how, how far along beyond the pan pandemic we go, especially because <laughs> the focus has been, the focus might, might shift if we ever get in a, into a, a properly uh, post-COVID period. So with those few remarks, I would like to uh, formally launch this, uh, the Agrarian South Research Bulletin. Um, um, is there anything? <laughs> uh, yeah. Maybe it would be good to show the cover of uh, the three issues once more. And uh, yeah, Joseph, please. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Lynn. The idea, as Lynn has uh, said, was to um, maintain a rhythm of uh, debate and publication in um, a format that is not, uh, does not involve full academic articles um, and which uh, also does not have the certain, uh, you know, does not maintain certain rigors in terms of citation and so forth that the academic articles require. Nonetheless, they emerge, the pieces that appear here emerge from research and are informed uh, empirically and theoretically by ongoing work. Um, it also intends to fill a certain gap um, uh, in the sense of um, uh, going beyond uh, quick uh, blog type of uh, uh, publications um, by putting together an organized monthly edition of uh, properly edited articles and, and, and thought out pieces. So that is the idea and it will go on. It's not um, the research uh, bulletin is uh, something that will hopefully last in many years and its focus will evolve and uh, become a forum for debate, uh, a monthly forum for debate. Yeah. So that's the, that's the idea. Uh, and um, on behalf of the network, I wish to express our sincere thanks to Lynn uh, as chief uh, editor of the research bulletin and to Damien Lobos, Frida Maswi and Manish Kumar who have joined the team and have been such a great source of uh, support and input. Um, Praveen, would you like to add anything? No, I'm, I think uh, both of you have said it all. And uh, of course, uh, as regards the themes, these would be evolving as we go along. Uh, our lives are not going to be easy in the foreseeable future. And, uh, you know, the challenges which are emanating and with no solutions anywhere in the site, uh, we can easily see a number of pressing issues which will keep hitting us from the point of view of uh, progressive political economy and uh, politics. 
So yes, uh, hands are full and uh, we have uh, in Lynn, as, as you said, uh, uh, a very, very competent, accomplished person to guide this initiative with the help of uh, the three young comrades. And uh, let's uh, try and do justice to this initiative, which promises quite a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Praveen. So Lynn, uh, yeah. our session today uh, is on uh, COVID-19 and insights from insights in South. Uh, so uh, I should uh, uh, you know, state in advance that uh, this is not necessarily on uh, research that uh, you yourself has conducted recently, although you will bring your own, your own uh, accumulated knowledge into this conversation. It is uh, an overview also of um, the debates that have been that have occurred in the research bulletin and uh, in our network over these last uh, six months. Um, I say this because after Lynn's um, talk, we will open up for questions and answers, but this questions and answers uh, session will not be uh, directed to Lynn as such uh, and her own research. And uh, we'll, it's a session where we can um, uh, uh, raise all kinds of issues and uh, make uh, comments and analyses of our, of, our, of our own. So Lynn, back to you. Okay, thank you, Paris. So um, what I'd like to focus on is, uh, just bring to the, the, the four the major themes that um, you know in my view have have emerged quite strongly in the three issues of the bulletin so far and they are you know there, there were many but I will focus on at least four main ones and then uh, think through some key lessons that we can draw in terms of our our work and our activism and so on. So one, the, the, the first, which is also um, an issue of great interest to me in my own work is the crisis of social reproduction. Uh, the crisis of social reproduction as we now understand it is endemic to capitalism and to a, a negligent neoliberal state which continues to produce huge, a huge surplus population. Uh, and, and COVID has intensified this crisis. And, and even those jobs that had fairly stable uh, income streams were rendered precarious overnight. Uh, precarity itself, you know, from the, the, the various pieces, uh, we, we have to understand it in a number of ways. One, in the form of labor, in the lack of security, in the heavy dependence on market forces uh, with little protection, in terms of worker safety in, in certain types of work with no health cover, in those jobs that are vulnerable to cycles of, of you know, feminization or defeminization in relation to the force of nature, uh, you know, the seasonality affecting the agrarian sector and some service sector workers. And although it is, you know, it's still hard to, to for us, it's still hard to measure the long-term impact of the pandemic on informal workers. Uh, existing uh, statistics or the statistics that uh, some of our contributors put forward point towards the deepening of a persistent crisis of social reproduction for all category of workers. And here I'm particularly uh, looking, uh, making reference to uh, Archana Prashad's work on India, who is with us at, on, on, on this call today. And, uh, and in, in the first issue of the bulletin, she highlighted the plight of domestic workers and uh, you know, showed the impact of the pandemic uh, showed that the impact of the pandemic on domestic workers has been structured by long-term vulnerabilities arising out of their lack of recognition as workers, which, which in a sense keeps them outside of the ambit of labor laws. And this in turn reflects the lack of adequate legal and institutional coverage. Uh, in other words, access to social protection, 
and domestic uh, and decent working conditions. Uh, apart from the loss of mobility, which was such a big factor, not just in India, but across uh, uh, many countries of the South, the denial of work was influenced by the popular perception that women living in, in slum habitations would bring infections to the homes of employers. So the stigma related to COVID uh, was playing an important role in the denial of work for, for migrant workers, for workers in the informal economy. Uh, so in, 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 the, in similar ways, we saw racism and you know, these forms of class disgust defining outcomes for millions of workers uh, across uh, the, the, the region. So even through, uh, even though the recognition, uh, you know, this is one of the things obviously that is more forcefully on the table, the, the recognition of informal work, uh, labor rights for those workers, uh, you know, as being a remedy for some of the deprivations they faced, the root cause of their distress is unlikely, as we have seen in this period, is unlikely to be resolved because the overall status of, of these workers is intimately linked with the crisis of social reproduction of other sectors of the working classes. And this is a key uh, 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 lesson or, or a key insight that we draw from, from some of the empirical work. Uh, in Latin America, uh, the, we, we did see some interesting um, initiatives that were responding to this crisis of social reproduction. Uh, the recognition of this crisis of social reproduction took the form of mass organizing. Uh, there were some popular sectors, peasant populations and indigenous peoples uh, who managed to sustain and recreate the collectivization of care, um, in, although in very limited uh, territories still. And, the, and this, this kind of uh, response, this kind of collectivization was done through control measures and income restrictions to their communities, migration to uninhabited jungle areas of the Amazon to protect their elderly, separation and community care of infected people, support for care with ancestral medicine, uh, management of community food uh, provision, community communication, national and international. National communication going forward. Uh, the second major uh, uh, theme was uh, around debt and the crisis of financialized capitalism. You know, the crisis that COVID uh, 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 put, uh, you know, brought up. So again, in, in, the, in the contributions, uh, we, we, we saw how in Latin America, the arrival of COVID exacerbated the main characteristics of state society relations. And these are huge socioeconomic inequality, authoritarian and police regimes, and neoliberal and corrupt governments. In short, the pandemic exposed the growing poverty, precariousness, and dehumanization of life. And, and this, the, the pandemic, uh, you know, in, in reality joined a series of crises. It's not an isolated crisis, circumscribes to the, to the health system, but a multi-sectoral crisis that reminds us of the limits of consumer society, of unbridled individualism, of an economic system that is related to the destruction of nature, where large multinational companies are above the state and dictate the rules of the game on a world scale for the production and distribution of food, water, and natural goods. This impact of increasing debt on ordinary people uh, uh, the, the, the impact of increasing debt on ordinary people, which is, you know, really, uh, you know, I think 
what this pandemic forced us to do in, in many ways was to think uh, beyond or in spite of the, the huge structural ways in which you usually think and to think in terms of what was happening to ordinary people. And a primary impact of course was the inability to create jobs and economic development. We already know that a key problem with financialization relates to its effects on households, right? Because real wages have become stagnant, people have turned to debt, the financialization of everyday life means that people have to borrow in order to consume and the public provision of health, education, housing is replaced by private provisioning of these public goods and, and drawing goods into the financial system and trapping them into uh, uh, rather drawing households into the financial system and trapping them in, in, in generational cycles of poverty. So working people's access to these necessities is also determined by historical inequalities on the basis of gender, of race, of sexuality, of ethnicity, caste, class. At the same time, uh, as, the, as, the, as the articles, uh, the contributions showed, a significant weakness of macroeconomic policy uh, under financialized capitalism pertains to a particular insensitivity to household demand and a neglect uh, with significant uh, negative incomes for individuals and households, which itself reflects a crisis tendency within capitalism or a crisis of care. Third, and, and a big issue, uh, a big concern in the, in the bulletin that kept kind of recurring under uh, almost um, in a cross-cutting way was the question of food, food security, uh, which, which a number of our contributors analyzed in relation to or versus food uh, sovereignty. So the pandemic highlighted the unsustainability, of course, of the existing models of food production and agriculture, which immediately affected those whose access to land, to the commons, to forests, to nature was relentlessly, has relentlessly been restricted through ongoing forms of, of land dispossession. So for example, as we learned from Paraguay, where, uh, Oh, nearly 30% of the 7 million inhabitants are poor. Uh, hunger and lack of access to food during lockdown had to be alleviated by the self-organization of the citizenry and the solidarity of social movements. Uh, while the food problem was enhanced by the pandemic, again, its root is in the, pro in the production models that is designed for the concentration of agriculture. In this case, grains. And uh, we saw again in Latin America, at least 6% of agricultural land is used for food production, which is insufficient. And as such, uh, uh, the, the Contributions showed, uh, you know, this heavy dependence on food imports from neighboring countries. Uh, there's little state interest in promoting and strengthening peasant agriculture. And, you know, where nearly 82% of edible foods in Paraguay are imported from its Latin American neighbors. The contributions from uh, Tunisia raised a fundamental challenge to this problem. This was in the, in the initial issue. Uh, and, and, and our comrades there argued that the function and the place of agriculture in society and the economy must be completely redefined. And a central question they posed is this, what should be the ends of agriculture? So they, are making, they were going back really to the radical basis of, you know, what is it that, you know, raising uh, not new 
but a renewed, uh, these questions with a renewed sense of urgency. Uh, and, and to this question, what they showed was that the use of agriculture is certainly not for the current users, which they are seeing in Tunisia, which has been to accumulate profits for a small minority of investors, and especially to meet the essential or exotic needs of wealthy consumers in the North. The, the food uh, question also uh, raised very clearly the su uh, supply chain vulnerability. Uh, the disruption in domestic and international supply chains, movement restrictions, barriers uh, uh, to transportation in post around the world, all of these led, led to a fall in sales in agricultural produce. Uh, the, the supply chain was simply broken despite, and this was interesting or important, the supply chain was broken despite no fall in production levels. As case studies from India indicated, uh, producer prices also fell. Although interestingly, the fall in producer prices were, was inimical to poor farmers everywhere. Uh, this fall in prices did not necessarily translate into a fall in consumer prices. In fact, consumer prices, what we saw was consumer prices became more volatile. And for, for some commodities, including cereals in India, there was a growing divergence between the wholesale price index and the consumer price index, indicating either higher transaction costs or higher rents in the supply chains. And this similar trend was also observed in some countries in Latin America and in China. Um, the, price, the prices of inputs uh, had risen due to the reliance on inputs for inputs in the South, uh, which has also made them particularly vulnerable to changes in production and exports from the North, as well as exchange rate changes. Uh, depreciations have also led to an increase in the cost of inputs in Latin America. So overall, the movement of prices has caused both a fall in agricultural incomes and an increase in the cost of food for people during this period. In Pakistan, we learned that uh, this was a very interesting empirical piece. And we learned that COVID had, far -reaching, uh, had a far reaching effect on the availability of pulses, what the contributor called the meat, meat for the majority because of various, again, supply chain issues such as shutdown of logistics operations, uh, limited granting of operating permission uh, to retail businesses under the COVID special operating procedures. So overall across the tri-continent, uh, the problem of dependency was rendered stuck during this period. Liberalization has made a number of developing countries reliant on ex exporting cash crops to Northern countries for foreign exchange and livelihoods on the other hand, some also rely on importing food for domestic consumption. So our dependence on foreign production and uh, foreign markets increasing, increased vulnerability of developing countries to fluctuations, of course, in foreign markets and exchange rates. So, you know, goes without saying that a global recession would have jeopardized food security and increased poverty. The last um, major thematic issue that the contributions dealt with was the question of social protection. Uh, and, and you know, this question returned to sharp focus during the pandemic. And the dilemma we sit with is the extent to which actually we can reasonably expect uh, the neoliberal state that has long abdicated that responsibility to step in and relieve the populace. In this sense, uh, I think uh, this, the question of social protection becomes a political rather than only an economic gamble. Uh, political because you know, states had to respond because their, their legitimacy really depends on, on the, the, the kinds of responses. Um, 
and 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 in, in the latest issue uh Adeshina identified some contradictions of the what what he identifies as a segregated social policy at work in many African countries in the context of neoliberal politics and policy regime the approach to social assistance was couched in the language of the demonstrably deserving poor extreme poverty and safety, uh, safety net the, this approach to social protection is built on the idea that the primary port of call for securing social protection uh, is the market uh, as the market gave way uh, during the pandemic and household reproductive capacities became overwhelmed the state had to intervene so the the, the various contributions have looked at the nature and extent of these interventions and and on the on the african continent this varied a great deal with south africa offering uh, somehow the more the, the the most extensive response based on a longer history of this of course uh, but everywhere all across the the continent um, in fact the tri-continent we saw some kind of intervention to ease the pressure uh, uh, and, and and of course the interventions were not done without significant pressure from, from a broad coalition of social movements and actors. Uh, and, and another contradiction in, in relation to social protection is the blindness of social policy to the informal sector. And this was really major given that the informal sector con constitutes um, up to 80%, 80 of the labor force in many of our countries. So while the informal sector is eligible to economic and labor stati statisticians, it remains blind to the national framework for, for social welfare, welfare support and provisioning. And while it is understood that the adverse livelihood impact falls disproportionately disproportionately on informal sector operatives, the key social assistance instruments uh, used in such contexts as say, uh, as Adeshina highlighted in Nigeria, in South Africa, were actually ineffective for reaching the informal sector operatives. And these are, I, I guess, present a, a quite clear policy concerns as we move forward. Lastly, I'd like to uh, speak about or um, you know, highlight a few of the key lessons that we can draw from, um, from the contributions in the three issues. Uh, our contributors in the bulletin wrote against attempts to cover up the causes of this devastating pandemic. Uh, which is related to colonial expansion of capital, as they showed, a production model that generates precariousness of life, high genetic manipulation that deforests and contaminates, and that violates the right to protest. COVID-19 is not a simple natural disaster and not a divine type punishment for human beings. It is one of the consequences of a model that has commodified all areas of life. All the studies published, you know, and I'm talking beyond the bulletin, all the studies published during the last months converge on at least one deadly finding that the, uh, and I'm talking of the more, I, obviously I don't mean all, all, but the, they, they converge on the finding that the capitalist intensive and extract, extractivist model which dominates world agriculture is directly responsible not only for the current pandemic but also for the impoverishment of animal and plant that, that biodiversity as well as for climate change whose direct and indirect consequences are already visible from our comrades in Tunisia, 
we learned that we can aim as a first step at the short-term creation of protective walls around the broad sector concerned with agriculture, with food, with natural resources and biodiversity, shielding it from the laws of the market against the mechanisms and standards of the world food systems and of course against a savage agribusiness model which does not seem to know any other God than profit. Uh, they also insist that we must radically change the paradigm and move to a social, ecological, equitable, sustainable agricultural policy with the peasantry at its heart and food sovereignty as an immediate requirement. So we must move from comparative advantages to imperative needs, from security, food security to food sovereignty and dignity, from imports to local production. In Argentina, or uh, in response to the agroecological imbalances that foresaw COVID, we learned that a program to create agroecological colonies in towns with low population density is being implemented at, at present out of a proposal by the Union of Workers of the Land, which, which include me, which is mainly the peasants and small producers. And this program will consist of the construction of houses and the concession of land, that is the, the uh, permit for the use of fiscal land to people who decide to move away from the, uh, the metropolitan area of Buenos Aires. The, the aim of this program is twofold. One is to decompress the large cities and at the same time to reduce the cost of shipping food to, to, to the small towns. Um, this, this kind of reverse migration away from cities, which, which earlier in the pandemic, unfortunately, was forced on many of the, the working poor when, when the pandemic broke, you know, more lately has forced us to reconsider real alternatives, you know, for the protection and just sustainability of nature, of our food, food, of climate, of health, and of well being. On the social reproduction crisis, COVID highlighted how important it is to make visible, to value, formalize, reorganize the distribution of labor between genders and between social and state spheres. As well, the case has been made for a publicly managed national social uh, insurance scheme uh, as being vital for the protection of jobs and livelihoods. I mean, this is not, you know, might not be radical in its in its uh, aims, but in countries where it could be implemented on a wider scale, we, we saw some, some, some relief, some kind of difference. Uh, and, and of course, this is antithetical to the existing neoliberal segregated market centric approach to social policy. Lastly, uh, social protests have not stopped during quarantine during lockdown, uh, everywhere and, and in many of the pieces uh, and, and of course in our own observations and participation, youth, women, neighborhood associations, unions, peasant and indigenous organizations have once again demonstrated their commitment in the struggle to build a different society. And these are the labors that we must continue to build on. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you uh, for that uh, robust uh, uh, resume, let's say, of, of, of a, a whole range of uh, debates and issues that have emerged in our research bulletin and in our conversations more, more generally. Um, let's uh, pass it, uh, the microphone di directly to Praveen before uh, we can um, come back with uh, 
uh, some uh, inputs from our viewers. Praveen, it's yours. Thank you, Comrade. Uh, and uh, Lynn, it was um, absolutely fabulous. Excellent rendering of uh, what this uh, bulletin has uh, tried to uh, map for itself in terms of both short-term and long-term concerns. So it's even though these are short pieces and so on, but uh, clearly uh, there, there, there is an academic gravitas, uh, not really in full flowing academic papers, long papers and so on, but in terms of engagement with the key issues and you I think put it extremely well in terms of capturing the ethos and the essence of what this exercise has been, which also sort of um, puts tremendous uh, burden of responsibility in uh, carrying it to the next stage, to sustaining it and so on. So thanks for this um, uh, kind of a overview summary and uh, weaving together uh, the key concerns which have emerged uh, through various contributions. Uh, as you said, I mean, you were not trying to capture everything, all the issues, but um, you have been a <clears throat> kind of a master weaver, a wonderful storyteller in terms of what the core issues have been. So, uh, I am deeply thankful to you, grateful to you for uh, putting the bulletin in perspective. Now, as you said, uh, um, broadly four or five areas in which you wanted to, uh, for sake of better comprehension, organization of the concerns of uh, what the contributors have tried to do, uh, you put them into certain uh, subheadings. So, in general, I would say that what the pandemic and these reflections on the pandemic try to capture very powerfully is a whole range of cleavages, fault lines, etc which were very brutally exposed during the pandemic and continue to be so. Yeah, that exposure, that whole uh, sort of, uh, you know, this, the, 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 the fact that uh, almost every problem which we had been talking about, had been engaged with in terms of our research, thinking, etc., was so powerfully kind of uh, sort of, it, 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 it was almost like an explosion of uh, the crisis of social reproduction, as you put it, uh, the challenges of debt, challenges of uh, financialized capitalism, uh, food security. You know, if you, if you look at some of the most recent reports in India, I mean, it, it is amazing that uh, how in uh, majority of the states, you know, malnutrition amongst children is uh, on the increase and Obviously, we don't have data as yet for the period of the pandemic, but clearly this would have you know, really challenged massively an already very fragile system. Right? Likewise, as you rightly pointed out, uh, the migrant labor in, in, um, uh, in a flash, in almost two, three days time, it seemed as if you know, a large chunk of workers the so-called migrant labor, although this word is a bit of a, you know, you know, this expression is a bit of a problematic expression, you know, sort of. Um, but I, let me not let me not get into that. Yeah, but uh, the fact that uh, suddenly uh, citizens are completely, uh, in a sense, become uh, bereft of uh, a sense of belonging. You know, they, 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 they have no home, right? What they had considered their home, because they had been working there for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, five years, whatever, right? 
suddenly becomes a most hostile place to be in. And they start looking for their homes. Right? Through those long journeys, and uh, which was absolutely heartrending, at least 25 to 30 million migrants were on the road. It was like a sort of, you know, mass non-violent rebellion against what had been imposed on them through an utterly ill-conceived shock and awe strategy of those who were in command, right? Sort of um, uh, many other sections, likewise. We have a lot of accounts, uh, as uh, you rightly pointed out, uh, studies converging on most of these themes. So for instance, if you look at an already very, very fragile and vulnerable world of work, what happens to it? Right? So in a country like India, as all of you know, you're talking of more than 90% of the workforce belonging to the so-called informal sector, which means basically no protection. Right? And of them, suddenly 80% within roughly a few hours are out of work. They have no savings, most of them, or savings which will not last more than a week, two weeks. That's what surveys reported. Several field surveys which are in public domain now. Right? Nowhere to turn to, nowhere to go to. Right? And then their only hope was that, okay, if they can somehow reach their home, 1,000 kilometers, 1,500 kilometers, and so on. Right? Yeah. So if we look at uh, ILO's very recent reports and uh, the income compression going beyond the reported number of hours that were lost right? and try and make sense of that. Again, it's a very, very troubling story. Right? In fact, the way we actually measure unemployment uh, is deeply inadequate from the point of view of understanding the import of employment in the most essential fashion. That is, it should generate adequate income for a decent livelihood, or at least a, at least a decent life. I mean, forget about, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, anything fancy in terms of protection and et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you look at that, you know, let's think of something which is linked to poverty benchmark. And think of that as, let's say, income unemployment, right? That is something which goes above that can be considered income employed. Falling below that, even if they're working, you know, we should call it effectively being income unemployed, right? And what are the implications of that? All these things were so powerfully put on the front burner. We were gasping for breath, trying to comprehend what was unfolding in front of our own eyes. Right? And some of these, as you rightly noted, have been picked up in the bulletin very well. The food security, again, you know, India is one of those countries which uh, unfortunately has seen per capita food consumption going down. Unlike most other countries, almost every other country, where with positive income growth, GDP growth, both the direct and indirect consumption of cereals and other food items translates into higher calories, right? And there have been studies, many studies which support this. India seems to be in a set of one where very significant income growth over a period of almost 40 years. And within this period for good 20, 30 years, you actually see decline in, which is the neoliberal period, 
you see the decline in per capita consumption and so on. You know, our two great uh, uh, mentors and comrades of the network, uh, the Patnaiks, they have repeatedly talked about this as being a serious concern. Right? That again hit disastrous levels as per the field reports that we have. There, there, there are no large scale surveys which have been done. It is too short a period, nine months or so, to get us good quality data on that. But there have been many surveys which tell you that there have been precipitous declines in food consumption. People have gone hungry, very significant number of them, 40%, 50%, 60%, according to different surveys and so on. And as is the case with almost every aspect of economic geography, not only in India, but everywhere in the world, that economic geography is very, very powerfully conditioned by social geography, as you were pointing out. Issues of race, gender, ethnicity, and what have you. Right? It comes out very powerfully that, for instance, Dalits in India, Muslims in India, right? the disproportionate hunger that they have had to deal with women in general amongst working people, right? return to jobs. You know, Archana is here. She, did, uh, she was associated with a research project in which they found how uh, the payments were delayed or they didn't get it, you know, domestic workers and so on, and how they were very, very seriously impacted, etc. cetera. Right? Now, so different categories. And the different concerns, each one of these that you highlight, you know, we find uh, uh, dealt with, at least in uh, terms of raising these issues quite well in the bulletin. And of course, the bulletin is supported by a huge amount of research, which is being done around the globe. And you rightly drew our attention to that. Right? And then as you said, uh, the policy response. What has been the policy response? See, unfortunately, we are, you know, if you look at last 30, 40 years, you see, there was a sort of a shame-faced neoliberalism for short periods. It was feeling somewhat guilty. Okay, no, 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 this is so then, no, suddenly you had this whole discourse on uh, 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 neoliberalism with the human face, globalization with the human face. Right? Uh, there were sort of short periods where we were talking about reluctant kind of neoliberalism in terms of the policy discourses and so on. Right? Today we have reached a point uh, which I and uh, Paris in some of our conversations, in some of our written works, like to call brazen neoliberalism, you know, punitive neoliberalism. If you don't listen to us, we just grab your throat, squeeze it hard, and you are done with. And that really is the most, you know, in terms of policy responses, the most hurtful thing that we are witnessing in our parts of the world. That is the you know, developing countries, the tri-continental sort of network that we are talking about. There are very few exceptions. Again, you rightly pointed out to uh, South Africa and it, what it was trying to do and so on a little bit, right? But in general, you know, this is where we are. You know? So it's not only the fault lines and the cleavages of the material world, the economic reality, which has been brutally exposed, but the policy hypocrisy has been as powerfully and as brutally exposed. Right? This is, again, I mean, in many countries, it has been uh, uh, brought out very clearly, but uh, Think of, uh, uh, again, India. I mean, I'm, I, I, I keep giving example 
of India because uh, we have been on a on a almost on a daily basis uh, dealing with a completely atrocious state and uh, its uh, uh, assaults, you know, uh, which are in the nature of if there was a court anywhere in the world, and I, we, we, we hear of these, uh, uh, you know, human uh, sort of courts, etc., cetera, in, uh, located somewhere in the Western world, uh, where the crimes against humanity should be tried. Right? They pick up one particular case and highlight so much, which we should not be dismissive about, you know, any, any particular incident and, uh, uh, any particular assault, uh, whether it's an individual or a group of people, and then you know, <clears throat> how that constitutes a kind of a humanitarian crime. Here we are talking about humanitarian crime on a mass scale. It's a humanitarian crime, not a humanitarian crisis. Putting it as humanitarian crisis is putting it mildly. It's a policy-driven, you know, crime. Yeah. So, the old adage, "crisis is an opportunity," has been used with remarkable, ironic efficacy and achievement. So, labor is suffering. Do away with all labor laws, whatever little you have. That is the opportunity, opportunity for capital, right? Now it's a most creative way of reinterpreting or using this adage crisis as opportunity. Right? I mean, it's just amazing, yeah? Laws are forced down the Populacy, yeah, large sections of whether it is the farming community, the workers, and so on, yeah, or uh, general laws which have implications for everyone. Mm -hmm. Using this cloak of the pandemic, that we must stand together in this moment of crisis, yeah, that is the only way forward and you keep sort of assaulting the population with one act after the other act. And as I said, the labor courts and so on and so forth in India, which many comrades here, I'm sure, would be aware of uh, details of these. Likewise, you know, in this utterly inhospitable daily winter, you have on different borders of Delhi, yeah, surrounding the neighboring states, yeah, you have at different points, different junctions, you have thousands of farmers, many of them in their 70s, 80s. We have already lost a few of them, you know, battling, utterly atrocious, assault on Indian agriculture, right? Now, this does not surprise many of us because this is a kind of a crisis of the model of development that we in a great and south, in our collective work, in our different publications, from the introduction to the journal, as you will recall, from that introduction onward, we have been saying, look, this is a disaster. No, this way of dealing with agriculture or agrarian question and not really comprehending it in a frame, in a fuller frame where it connects with everything, gender, ecology, industrialization, and how do we see the balance between the different components and so on. Yeah. Now, this again has been brought in very, very powerful kind of sort of uh, uh, display, the contradictions of this, this model of development, which has been a, uh, 
uh, kind of a global tragedy, right? And um, uh, that again has been used by India's policymakers to not be even sensitive. Yeah, okay, let's listen to you. Let's listen to the questions that we have. But again, pushing for what I suggested earlier as a brazen, punitive neoliberalism where everything which is property of the collective, of the society is up for grabs. Yeah, not only assets, etc., built with the hard labor of our laboring people, working people, women and men over generations. Not only that, but the nature itself. What gives anyone right to become the owner of the soil? The only meaningful ownership can be that of the collective, of the society, where then you use it judiciously to make sure that you leave for the next generation more than what you got, more than what you can consume for yourself as regards these precious resources. Right? It's just the opposite of that that we are witnessing in India. Right? So it is uh, really very, very uh, clear where the political masters are headed by and large. Right? There may be variations in texts and subtexts across different countries, but the broad trajectory is very clear. And with that, let me come to the last point that you raised, which is that, yes, working people everywhere are trying to resist it. This again comes out powerfully in the pandemic. In India, on 26th of November, which incidentally is our Constitution Day, in, if, if we have the most uh, uh, respected kind of, uh, you know, book that we can swear by, it is our Constitution. And if one wants to be a kind of a religious person, that should be the core of that religiosity. Yeah. On that day, these farmers started marching. On that day, we had 250 million workers across the country, working people and those in support of them. Yeah, according to different estimates, as reported in the media very widely, there was massive support, right? So yes, there is an attempt to reclaim the space and try and move forward. It is not going to be easy. Yeah. Given the kind of models of governance that we have, given let's say in case of India, a model where first pass the vote system, first pass the post system, grabs it all. Okay. Then you can have a tiny minority or maybe not tiny, but more than tiny or significant minority at different junctures who then speak for the nation at large, the country at large, yeah? And how do we then deal with that? See, at least a true representative democracy would have put some checks and balances, right? Can we think about those things for the long run, for these debates on models of democracy, yeah? Models of governance, maybe in due course as we get into, let's say the next bulletins, we can look at these models across the world, see the relevance of, from the point of view of working people, which works better, which does not. Right? So the sort of 
social movements are trying to do their bit. Yeah. Of course, there are lots of divisions we all know, right? Um, but you know, it 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 has been, and and and, and, and I, I I think it's important for us to note uh, uh, to to sort of uh, not only to salute the resilience and the resistance of the people, but if there is any hope, it is it lies there, right? And to again try and understand these resistances, these uh, movements which are going on, both in terms of, let's say, uh, expressions through old-fashioned channels of organized either trade unions and similar organizations, or through other kinds of channels and other kinds of expressions, etc. Right. So uh, we, uh, again, maybe in uh, one of uh, the next uh, tasks that uh, we should maybe set out for ourselves is to uh, try and see how in the pandemic across the world, what were the kinds of responses and movements and so on and uh, uh, the implications of that for not only highlighting the challenges that we have, but in terms of moving forward as well. Right? This, I also say not only to salute them, but also, as I said, that uh, uh, the great uh, uh, hunchback from Torino, yeah, uh, Antonio Gramsci. Mm -hmm. You might have all the pessimism of the intellect, but you must end up with optimism of the will. There is no other way. Thank you. Thank you, Pling. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed uh, to both of you for. Um, this uh, broad uh, canvas that uh, we have put before us. Uh, the, we can open now for uh, questions and, com and comments from um, uh, um, our audience and participants here. I have several questions of my own and comments to make, but let's see if uh, anyone has um, uh, anything to add here. We have uh, a comment by Damien Lobos, who is one of uh, the members of the editorial team of the Research Bulletin. Um, comrades, uh, uh, speaking with Praveen, final points, I would like to know what your, your readings are about relations of forces in the conjuncture. Working people who resist have shown to be very strong, but there's also a certain thematic and strategic disaggregation. With regard to the state here in Latin America, there's a certain hope and rebirth of progressives, progressives and the left, but in all cases, assuming that there is a situation of high pressure and limitations. Of course, this is uh, uh, one of the issues that comes out, uh, especially in, in, in well, in, the, in both of your comments, the, the, the social responses and the types of social responses we can expect or um, wish to see in these in the world in the societies of the south in particular, given that uh, uh, they are societies uh, um, uh, which are uh, inserted into the capitalist system in a very informal way. Uh, we are not talking about wage laborers that have uh, proper incomes. Uh, it is uh, a society whose majority on a world scale has a very problematic relationship with wage labor. That's uh, a type of uh, semi uh, proletarianized workforce, whether it's urban based or rural based, uh, very formal, uh, very periodic, um, very sodic relations with uh, wages. And the types of organizations that, that emerge from this type of society are not the kinds that um, perhaps uh, some might expect. Uh, 
it's not necessarily the trade unions that uh, take the lead, but all kinds of uh, organizations that Lynn uh, pointed to or Praveen pointed to, farmers' movements, uh, community organizations, um, in many places, uh, uh, religious organizations have come in, uh, organizations that uh, uh, have their own organic roots, in one way or another, to, to this type of society. Um, the, if I could add to Damien's comment about Latin America, it is a certain, it is certainly a, 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 a disputed uh, uh, juncture, conjuncture. Yeah, there's uh, all kinds of tendencies that are rising, both progressive and reactionary. Uh, and it remains an open question which way this, this is going. Uh, we were coming into, we had, even before the pandemic, we had a um, situation of uh, reactionary uh, governments taking over, whether by uh, elections or fraudulent, fraudulent elections or by uh, interventions of militaries followed by uh, mock elections, as in Bolivia, for example. But also in Brazil, we have had uh, fraudulent elections, and in fact, interventions by, by military behind the scenes. Uh, this was the situation before the pandemic. And today, um, there, are, there has been, for example, uh, a return to elections in, in Bolivia. Uh, there has been a, a a progressive result to elections in, uh, in Venezuela. Yeah. Uh, and um, we just have to wait and see how these things turn out uh, in the coming months and in 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 years. But it is a disputed, certainly a disputed conjuncture. At the same time, we have uh, contradictions which are seem to be maturing in the North, especially in the United States. There seems to be an escalation of contradictions which are um, uh, which do not compare to what was going on earlier in the last few decades. There is certainly uh, an a, a impoverishment that has been ongoing, and that which today has taken on a, a political uh, confrontation. Um, and this has to be also taken into account in, in, as we move forward. The uh, another aspect which uh, needs to be, I believe, put on uh, the table is the fact that uh, beyond the, or on top of the precarious social situation in the countries of the South, there has also been a very aggressive uh, militarized and sanctions policy that has been uh, imposed on the regions and countries around the world, and the pandemic struck in, 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 a, in, a, in a time when countries were in the vice grip of sanctions and uh, uh, bellicose um, uh, incursions in various regions. Uh, Venezuela is one of these uh, situations. Um, uh, Zimbabwe is another, sanctions for over 20 years. Iran is another. Uh, of course, we can go around the world. The sanctions regime is very strong around the world. Um, so this is also uh, a, a reminder that uh, the methods have not changed and that um, uh, social contradictions and social protests will have to come up against the, the known methods of uh, punishment and control that have been meted out for so many, for so many decades. Uh, it is certainly our generation and the new generations that are coming on board that will have to uh, rise to the challenge. This crisis that we are confronting will not go away uh, next year or in the coming years. It is really a generational crisis. It is a political age that um, will have to uh, um, mature. Yeah. It is a political age unlike any other, uh, with, which will have its own political expressions. Uh, its own types of movements, its own type of politics, uh, and uh, um, and whose issues, of course, uh, Lynn has already brought to the fore 
in her uh, discussion, the four points, there are actually more than four points, but the four points that were uh, uh, stated as such, the social reproduction crisis, so movements that are coming in in this political age will have to really uh, give priority and theorize and organize politically around this, the, the issue of social reproduction and uh, the urgency of the transformation of gender relations and relations between society and the state on issues of social reproduction. Um, of course, the question um, is uh, a perennial issue that uh, will have to uh, be overcome in a very radical way. Uh, food security, these are the issues that are, are also food sovereignty. These are issues that are putting a bit that are, that are entered into our political consciousness in ways uh, which are unique uh, in the 21st century. And social protection, of course. This is all uh, uh, urgent in the types of societies that have taken hold uh, across the South. So um, all I can uh, say in addition to what has been said is that um, our own efforts in this regard are to provide a platform uh, apart from our individualized involvements in our, in our own countries and regions as a collective uh, enterprise, uh, uh, our objective is to provide a platform for um, this new political age. Uh, th we have uh, uh, inaugurated this, this series uh, on uh, the crisis on the, through online dialogues. Um, we have our research bulletin and this can evolve in many ways. It is the, the purpose to have a, a forum for organized monthly debate and also our journal will take this forward. Uh, as we, let me see here if there's any further issues uh, amongst our, our comrades who are participating. Would anyone like to add, subtract? Ricardo Jacobs, Ricardo Jacobs, uh, I'll have to talk, Ricardo. Right. Yeah. Can you hear? Hi, Ricardo. Yeah, yeah I can hear you. Please. Please, Ricardo. Uh, all right, I can continue. Yeah, my, my question is, uh, uh, you, you can hear me, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, Please, Ricardo. I, I, yeah thank you for uh, this, uh, this wonderful uh, panel and congratulations on the research bulletin. Uh, it's certainly a, a, bre a breath of fresh air in this current period. Um, to bring out uh, this type of work, uh, particularly from the global south, and uh, uh, you know, stamping its authority on the world. Uh, my, and 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 I want to follow with this question on, uh, and and perhaps to both the Lynn and uh, Praveen, or it's a general question. Like, is I, I understand the concept of uh, uh, working people or uh, uh, the different social forces that emerge from uh, society, but in this period, we we are also seeing that the 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 role of labor, wage labor, the point of production. That if there is a national strike or a general strike, that it is consequential. So I, I want to ask about how do you see who are the 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 social agents in this period uh, that that perhaps would put pressure on the role of wage labor, I understand there is all and, and how do the unemployed and the employed sort of link up uh, in, in this sphere uh, as part of this new wave of struggle. And, and then I also want to see how do you see the, the limits of these type of protest movements. Uh, Paris sort of touch on, on some of it. Uh, my, my, my second question is we have also seen the complete militarization of containing the pandemic in countries like South Africa, Nigeria, uh, uh, where the police and the military, the army was sort of unleashed to sort of contain the pandemic. Uh, and I want to, the question is, how do you see the role of the sort of militarization or the containment of uh, this massive explosion of, of surplus population of an informal workers post the pandemic. 
And just then the care economy to, to Lynn, uh, are we seeing uh, ways in which people are reverting to sort of uh, mutual aid, uh, that type of form of survival within uh, this period and, and particularly the role of women in this current wave of struggle uh, in particular? Uh, I mean, in Africa and also in the global South more generally. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. We also have uh, a, a hand up uh, by Issa. Come in, Issa. Please, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Lynn and Praveen, for raising very fundamental issues. If the 2008 uh, prime mortgage crisis in the U.S expose part of the financialization of capitalism. This pandemic, as you, both of you point out, really have, has exposed all along the spectrum, the full gamut of neoliberalism. And I think Lin has summarized extremely well of how built-in crisis of capitalism that we've always been talking about, although we could not foresee <clears throat> how this crisis would be would manifest itself until this pandemic, how the pandemic has exposed the, 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 the fundamental crisis of capitalism and financial capitalism as well as this new first neoliberalism. I would like to elaborate a bit on the last point that Praveen was making. And I think we need to explore that much more, that besides the crisis of neoliberal capitalism, I think it is also exposing in, in, in a kind of dramatic fashion, the crisis of liberal democracy the models of governance that we are used to fall back on, the whole liberal democracy by which many of our liberals and left have been swearing actually. And that we have seen very exposed and particularly in the case of, uh, in the case of India. Uh, the, the, one of the issues of Agrarian South on, 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 on Samir Amin. Uh, Samir Amin often talked about fraudulent democracy. And he argued that fraudulent democracy leads to fascism. Now, that was a general point. But it seems to me now that has really come in, right in front of our eyes, particularly with what is happening in India. What Praveen has described as a massive crime against humanity. That has been the response of a government that has come to power through liberal, democ liberal democracy. So it really exposes this model of, uh, of, of, of governance that we have used to and we talk about often. And I'm thinking of how our intellectuals, even somewhat progressive intellectuals in Africa, fall back more or less like a knee-jerk reaction to, to liberal democracy. While in Africa, there's been uneven response. Uh, uh, Ricardo has pointed out militarization uh, in, in Nigeria, in South Africa and elsewhere. But in other countries el as, as well, although there's un uneven responses, depending on the intensity of the pandemic. But we're already seeing all over the place proto-fascist reactions in terms of political governance. Now, where does that leave us? What kind of alternative political discourse, what kind of alternative organizational discourses do we have to begin to think about and develop. Because I think it's extremely important that in such a situation of crisis, 
intellectuals to work from the standpoint of the working people should be able should be able to develop alternative discourses on which eventually people can fall back on and see that there are certain things possible the working people in india have shown us the massive protests that is more than a silver lining but more than that how do we carry that forward because it seems to me that and pravin will correct me if i'm wrong that the 250 million people who are who have occupied highways for the last two weeks or so clearly protesting against new liberal policies that practical action of course did not just develop that practical protest that, that practical action is also if i may say the fruit of the long discourse against new liberalism that was developed by radical intellectuals you see so so it is not it is not unimportant if i may say sorry although i think i'm i'm understanding it to develop ideas to develop alternative discourses and ideas and i think in one area we have to develop alternative ideas and discourses is the area of political governance now some work has already started being done on the whole use of the concept of the commons and i personally believe and i would like to hear comes reaction to that 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 is probably one thing that holds a promise for developing alternative discourse not only the traditional commons but the new commons not only the commons in each individual countries and so called nations with with this with this boundaries with the pandemic has shown how artificial these boundaries are okay but sort of global commons from the standpoint of the working people and how on the basis of global commons we can work towards building solidarities across borders that's the short comment i want to make thank you thank you isa there is one other comment that came in comment and question that came in through the chat uh, if i may read this out and then we can uh, go back to lin and uh, praveen uh, this is from uh, sudeep shret shretza um from nepal if i'm not mistaken congratulations for the release of the bulletin uh, this is directed to praveen uh, the comment is as the great marxist leader rosa luxembourg pointed out in her magnum opus accumulation of capital in the chapter the struggle against natural economy what then the british ruler did in india and french ruler in algeria for land grabbing i think a present neoliberal regime is also doing the same in the name of farm reform in india in the of covid-19 how do you assess and compare this and uh, uh, most ironic uh, for us nepalese that here sugarcane farmers are in the streets in Kathmandu the different parts of the country demanding the payment of the sugarcane uh, of of uh, previous years here the so called left government has become vehicle of neoliberal policy farmers in india and nepal along with other people are in stress how do you see the outcome of this uh, quote unquote humanitarian crime caused by neoliberal policy so there you go the comparison between the poor and uh, in india on uh, the farmers uh, protests so let's go back uh, to back to lin uh, and uh, also also archana has read but let's uh, uh, come back to we still have time let's go back uh, to lin for now and then we'll, we'll start with uh, archana next round please lin thank you for for all of your uh, comments i mean i think they all converge around this sense of desperation in a sense that we have uh, out of this period and what needs to be done 
um, Ricardo, I'll, I'll, you know, on the question of militarization uh, and how do we see the role of, of militarization? I think, you know, my own sense is to look at it in relation to the, the, the question, the very significant uh, point that Isa has made around the crisis of, of liberal democracy itself. You know, one of the things that, that, that liberal democracy has bequeathed us with is this language of rights. It's a very kind of, it's a language of rights that is bereft of concept, uh, context, is bereft of history, is bereft of politics. And so, you know, the demand for rights, which is really the language between us and the, the liberal democratic state, whichever form exists. The demand for right places on the one side, the individual, the individual, not the collective. And on the other hand, on the other side is the state. So we are not, you know, I don't think we are any longer speaking about collectives against the state. We are talking about the individual against the state. That is who the state doesn't recognize us, you know, you know, the granting of rights, whether it's in the constitution or conventions or whatever are granted on this basis. And so I, my sense is that our, our movements lack coherence in a real sense. And, and the violence that is being directed, I, I don't think a state that knows that it's dealing with a, an entire movement, you know, take the numbers that Praveen is describing in India a state that, that has a sense that it is dealing with this massive movement uh, or collectives of people is going to be that brazen in using violence. These are states that think they're still dealing with individuals and they've used all the tactics, uh, you know, including the, the politics of caste and race and gender and so on. So I, I would put it back to this you know, alongside our struggles, our agrarian struggles, and I think as Praveen pointed out, and as Isa is saying, we have to deal very seriously with this question of democracy and, and how it is that it is playing out uh, in our context. Because, the, because violence, you know, I've, I've, all, I've argued in a lot of my work how, or, you know, the, the liberal democratic form of governance is an inherently violent form of governance and it plays out. And so earlier on in the year when I was reflecting on this militarization of the response, it wasn't surprising to me at all. If we are going to be people who, you know, anytime we are trying to reclaim certain parts of our dignity or our humanity are calling on the state, then the state is going to respond to us through the means that it has, that, you know, that it has kind of perfected over the decades. Um, on the question of care economy and uh, the care economy or, or, and whether we are seeing a reversal to mutual aid, I don't think it's a, a reversal. I, I mean, I think it's never stopped. You know, I think that one of the most profound things that this pandemic period has shown us is just how much or the extent to which uh, the care economy, the regime of gendered labor and reproductive labor is actually, has actually been propping up uh, uh, neoliberalism in the course of the last four decades. This is not new. What it did was that it just brought it to the surface because of the intensity, you know, with the, with the, you know, the, the collapse of the market. We, we were essentially having a conversation between the state and the household for the first time, a very direct line between the state and the household. And I think that there's something there that we can build on and that we can continue to expose, but it is certainly not, not a reversal. This role has, has really been the foundation of this regime of capitalism. Thank you, Lynn. Praveen. 
Yes, comrade, and uh, a very insightful uh, observations, remarks, elaboration. Uh, uh, comrade Isa, for instance, uh, uh, sort of uh, was uh, drawing our attention to some of the most pressing issues, which uh, tangentially I referred to, and uh, how do we take it uh, in terms of our work, in the bulletin, in the journal, and in our collective uh, efforts through uh, our political work as well as academic work to uh, sort of uh, uh, next level. And I completely agree with uh, uh, with 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 Isa as regards his emphasis on uh, uh, both the things, the the, 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 the whole question of. Uh, uh, Commons, how do we envision that? We know that there has been this discourse off and on, you know, sort of uh, sometimes um, quite prominent, sometimes it has receded into the background and so on, but for a very long time. Uh, good, uh, you know, in the, in, in the, certainly in the history of uh, uh, classical Marxist political economy, of which uh, uh, Isa is one of the finest exponents. So, you know, this this is something which we need to bring back on the absolutely front burner. And uh, you know, for instance, all these deals that uh, if you look at last 30, 40 years, even in the time of neoliberalism, we keep talking of all kinds of protocols, you know, Kyoto Protocol and Paris Protocol and so on, which is basically what? A lip service to the idea of these global commons, but uh, effectively just going against it. Yeah. So how do we reclaim these discourses? Yeah, I mean, uh, there is a lot of uh, work which is happening, but then in terms of politics, et cetera. So I think uh, what uh, Comrade uh, Isa has uh, drawn our attention to is indeed one of the most profound challenges that we need to deal with here and now. I mean, <laughs> these things cannot be uh, sort of uh, uh, put on the margin of discourses and uh, uh, likewise, the whole question of, again, uh, uh, late uh, uh, great Samir Amin and uh, his uh, sort of investigations of forms of democracy and fraudulent democracy leading to fascism. And, uh, you know, we are staring at something which uh, many of us who actually before 2014 were worried about it, but even amongst progressives, there was a very large chunk which did not see it coming. The kind of regime that we are confronting today, right? Its intensity, its sort of, you know, venality, it's uh, et cetera, et cetera, you know, sort of. Uh, so yes, uh, to explore these things and then look at what kind of uh, efforts, etc., uh, which are required. And um, yes, the numbers that uh, are in the uh, different media as regards those who are resisting, protesting, and so on, the numbers are impressive, sure enough. Yeah. Uh, a couple of days ago, I mean, you know, India has about 700 districts which are. Uh, uh, sort of uh, units of you know, lower level units of administration and so on. Roughly in half of these districts, there have been protests. Right? District headquarters, there have been protests and so on. The real challenges, where will the coherence come from? Right? You know, way back in 1950s, uh, this Indian um, author, uh, who grew up in West Indies, Naipaul, yeah, of Indian origin who grew up there. So, you know, we should not uh, uh, call him Indian <laughs> in that sense, who got Nobel Prize. Yeah. So, uh, he had a phrase which uh, remained etched in my memory, which has remained etched in my memory for the last 30 odd years. You know, uh, he talked of India a country of million mutinies, it's just that they don't come together. Million mutinies, you know, that's what he <laughs> referred to, right? And the addition, 
his mind that these do not come together right uh, yes a few issues currently you know in this resistance this farmers movement uh, have got focused and hopefully there is a greater purpose in terms of substantial coherence at least on focusing on these disastrous laws which is a crime against agriculture in my way of looking at it you know it's a, it's a kind of development trajectory that we must reject and so on something which again we have been talking about for uh, several years and uh, if that succeeds i mean there is some window some opening yeah and then how do we go forward and so on so um, uh, comrade isa you know you uh, i'm sure you are uh, sort of uh, wishing us well wishing the movements in india well um, we can be at least optimistic yeah but how it pans out we know that the regime is vicious let there be no illusions about it okay i mean whether you know they will consider the minimal demands which uh, have been put there and the minimal is the maximal in this case because they basically saying that look repeal the laws right and without that there's no move forward they can easily repeal these bring back the new laws negotiate first with the farmers in fact uh, put in some of the provisions that they want to and there could be some uh, at least uh, you know uh, sort of um, conversation and uh, uh, some give and take etc which will not solve the deeper problems right but at least you know this deadlock would be broken then i think that's the situation as regards the farmers uh, uh, resistance in particular you know as regards vis-a-vis -vis workers in spite of very huge numbers there is not even a recognition of the concerns that they have been you know putting up uh, valiantly and for uh, several years now and there have been you know series of these pretty substantive uh, protests in terms of numbers on uh, the labor situation but last 6 years or so there is not an iota of even you know recognizing what could be a point for discussion and discourse and with the in fact uh, the only forum in which these discussions used to be held uh, indian labor conference that has been done away with where you had the workers the employers the state and so on that has been simply been done away with not officially but you know no meetings are convened right uh, the person who's uh, sort of okay, let me not uh, get into lots of these details which uh, then uh, uh, create a situation of libel so to say <laughs> yeah <laughs> in terms of uh, uh, naming and shaming so you know let me let me not get into lots of these issues but uh, yes indeed uh, the issues which uh, uh professor shiv ji has drawn our attention to i think um, we need to do lot more work on likewise uh, you know coming to i mean sort of the concerns and the questions and responses you know ricardo uh, sudeep uh, sudeep uh, was a student of ours at jawaharlal nehru university and uh, is an activist in kathmandu and also you know very uh, very engaged progressive uh, uh academic and activist so sudeep of course as you know uh, you know you you uh, talked of uh, uh, the great uh, rosa luxemburg mm, and uh, uh, how she had uh, uh, analyzed a particular conjuncture and situation and so on yes i mean these things keep uh, playing and replaying in history no sudeep yeah this is this is something which uh, we know that you know there are bouts of uh accelerated primitive accumulation right at different junctures different points and so on so yes indeed i mean that is that is uh, uh, very much uh, on display and in fact you see this whole business of uh, 
how the left becomes an ally of neoliberalism, you know, that was Tony Blair, that was uh, our uh, uh, SPD in Germany and so on and so forth. Yes, you see, that third way was the way to so-called uh, hell. I mean, if you believe in, uh, you know, those formulations, but uh, the argument was that this will serve everyone's uh, interest and so on. So, as you know, the, 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 the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So the likes of Schroeder and Tony Blair and uh, then everyone following them in different parts of the world. And yeah, that was that was the beginning of it. And where even the Maoist left in uh, uh, Nepal, unfortunately, how that has been uh, ensnared by it. Yeah, so yes, so Sudip, you know the details very well. Let me not uh, get into it. But this is this is something which uh, we have to think of as a massive, huge challenge that is confronting us. Uh, Ricardo, yes, um, you know, uh, one of the most important laws in Marx's laws is law of primary accumulation, which says what? Basically, endless, ceaseless production of surplus population. That, to my mind, is the most important law in terms of an understanding of spontaneous capitalism. Right? You had a certain kind of labor being coming to the fore as social political agency because of very specific juncture, very specific sort of elements in that larger trajectory, right? Which was massively helped by colonialism, imperialism, etc. Right? Which resulted in the formation of the core and the periphery and so on. Right? In case of rest of us in the periphery, which is almost six billion of the world, right? And it's, a, it's, it's again another irony that we call it periphery, right? So, in this periphery, uh, it has to be very serious building of partnerships between all these different segmented kinds of uh, uh, what uh, Professor Shiji keeps uh, uh, reminding us that we should call them working people. Uh, you, I'm sure, Ricardo, you know it very well that uh, we have uh, very frequently talked of uh, the classical Marxist categories in terms of uh, uh, relative surplus population and uh, uh, proto and semi-proletariat and so on and so forth. Yeah, so whichever way we want to phrase it, call it, etc., that partnership is, uh, you know, absolutely central and uh, uh, there the labor will have to be. Uh, I mean, the, the, the centrality of labor and the, it's, that, 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 that agency of labor, the centrality of labor, is not only that of the so-called, uh, you know, privileged, organized labor aristocracy, right? And which is where yeah, it's extremely important to think of how to build bridges and uh, cooperation and uh, coordination uh, amongst uh, every constituency, right? One of the greatest... Uh, I mean, can we... Yep. Yeah, one, one last point on this, you know, B.T. Ranadive, you know, uh, uh, sort of a trade unionist uh, and, a, and, a, and a left, uh, uh, you know, um, thinker of great repute, as, 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 as he put it, the organized sector, which is the so-called formal sector, that was in 1950s, that if it does not get into working with the rest of them, there will be no future for this sector. Right? So that was a very important point and very important thing that he had uh, emphasized then. Yeah. And which is the only way forward. Right? So in terms of, you know, so Demian and Ricardo, this production and uh, of surplus people, etc. will go on endlessly. Right? Till the spontaneous capitalism is challenged, is controlled as long as you believe in capitalism. Right? But then this itself is something on which there's a 
huge question mark will capitalism deliver right for that then we have to talk of other things thank you thank you for the uh, we have we have, uh, we have um, a few more minutes uh, and uh, let's try to to uh, uh, keep it uh, brief archana are you there So, uh, actually, I just wanted to, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about resistance and the farmers' issues and all this. I just want to sort of uh, say that I think we should be a bit careful about how we look at this conjecture in the farmers' movement, because the farmers' movement is, as Isa and Praveen also said, it's been going on for some time. But I think the movement today is a little different from what happened uh, maybe even two years ago with the long march and things like that. See, if you go to the different borders where the farmers are sitting, there are a couple of interesting points to note. If you go to the uh, most famous and the most jammed border, which is the Singhu border, actually the farmers over there they have all their supplies. They, they're also getting help, but they have all their own supplies also. And they are really actually not the most underprivileged farmers who are sitting there. But if you go to the Tikri border, uh, from what I could make out at least, there are farmers who are coming in cycles, in rotation, and trying to help each other through the this thing what the point that the short point that i'm trying to make is that for the first time within the farmers movement we are seeing a, a massive alliance between all segments mm -hmm. of the farmers and the agricultural workers because the current laws which were in the pipeline for some time now have now openly made a direct attack on the livelihood of the big farmers also, of the big farmers also, which is not the case with the workers' movement right now. The workers' movement, of course, all the workers are in a bad shape. It's a deep crisis and all, but the contradictions with, between the workers are actually deepening, according to me, rather than resolving themselves. So obviously the movement uh, will have to, uh, 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 we'll have to come up with something, as Praveen said, better in order to make that unity. But I don't think that that unity can be uh, um, on labor laws, because anyway, 90% of the people were outside the scope of the labor laws. So uh, uh, that's one thing. And as far as care work is concerned, Lynn also made the point, but I feel that at least from what I can observe, in fact, instead of mutual aid, what is happening is that the uh, privatization of care work is becoming even more exclusive and extreme. And the fragmentation that is coming about is really great from all this work from home business. You know, people are not in touch with each other. They can't see each other. They can't organize with each other. Even as students and people uh, uh, who used to organize or teachers who used to organize, the pandemic has actually put uh, the challenge of organizing up front very, very starkly. And I think that uh, uh, while we have to think of the forms of organization and communication, I think also, you know, I mean, theory comes out of practice. So if you don't change your practice, your theory will also not change much. And uh, so the two things uh, uh, have to go together. So that praxis, I, I don't see that in evolving much because the, um, uh, the uh, distance between the working class and the intellectuals is also widening rather than narrowing in my, experience at least and i wonder how we're going to resolve that problem yes that is 
I think we should uh, certainly sir. join uh, Damien and uh, Manish and Freedom uh, as part of uh, this bulletin team uh, if they have uh, any remark to make. Yeah, before we close. Manish, have, uh, yeah. uh, Damien and Freedom, would you like to uh, turn on your cameras? Are you? They deserve our congratulations and uh, you know, long been for uh, doing a very uh, sort of uh, credible work. Yes. Yeah. So, if they have yes any anything Fantastic to say, please. Work. Yeah. Okay. Um, nothing much to say, but just to thank um, the Agrarian South Network, our editor, for the work which she has been doing in steering uh, the whole. Uh, editorial team pushing this all work and we hope to continue doing well. Uh, we continue to learn from the various pieces which come uh, from all the three continents. So thank you very much for the cooperation. Um, yes, um, the, the same thing. It was a very, very uh, important experience. Uh, it was a great uh, discussion and a great space uh, with the, com the comrades. And well, uh, hopefully we, we, we keep on going uh, with this. Thank you very much. Yes, of course. Manish. Yeah, uh, even I don't have any uh, much to add uh, what Freedom and Damien had just uh, said. Uh, it was indeed a pleasure and uh, 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 honor to be part of a great team that is bringing together uh, great work. So I'm very thankful to the Agrarian South Network for including me in the, in the team. And uh, as Professor Prashad was just mentioning about the uh, field-based uh, content, so maybe in future we will bring more uh, experiences the, this pieces from the field and uh, very soon we are coming with, uh, from India there will be a piece on the current agrarian uh, this farm farmers protest and that we will include so I hope uh, uh, we will keep up, keep it up and uh, uh, we will try to improve in future as well of course thank you very much to the three of you and to Lynn uh, for spearheading this initiative. Um, we hope that they will continue to grow and become a location of uh, profound debate and systematic debate over the long term. Um, thanks also to Praveen for uh, rounding off all these debates and giving your own insight into these pressing issues. Uh, we have uh, much work ahead. As I mentioned in the beginning, this is uh, the last online dialogue uh, a session. Anyway, um, the series is coming to an end online. Uh, we will have to assess um, this experience and see how to proceed next year. But as I also mentioned, uh, the Specters of Crisis, Rays of Hope, series as a whole includes the research bulletin, which will continue, and also the special section in our journal, uh, which will start this month with a, um, with a number of articles and it will continue into next year. As far as uh, uh, next year is concerned, we will make uh, some uh, decisions uh, in the coming weeks, but um, uh, just to you that uh, we have our summer school that will be held in a month's time. It will be an adapted version online with uh, a few sessions, of course, um, uh, during the last week of, of January. Uh, and this will include, in fact, in, uh, on uh, Monday, the 25th of January, a, they, they will kick off with a, a celebration of uh, our journal, Agrarian South, which will be, will be celebrating the 10 years since its founding in um, uh, uh, 
the first issues that came out in 2012, we've actually finished now the whole decade. Some 30 issues have come out, uh, 10 volumes. And uh, this uh, celebration will take the form of a, of a, a conversation uh, whose uh, contours will be, will be defined very soon. Uh, there will also be the Sam Moore Memorial Lecture, the fourth Sam Moore Memorial Lecture on Tuesday, the 26th. This will be given by uh, Dr. Michael Witter from um, uh, the University of West Indies in Jamaica. Uh, and then we'll have the sessions of the summer school on that uh, Wednesday, uh, Friday of that last week of January. After that, we will be in constant touch via social media to let you know what the, the, the ongoing plan is that we'll uh, go for. I assure for participating, for uh, um, tuning this uh, debate. I could not have done this without you. Uh, we have all there, gone through this collective learning experience, which is our method uh, I'm back sorry <laughs> there was a uh, hear me now can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, sorry. So just wrapping up, um, the will be very soon. Uh, thanks, uh, last but not least, to our wonderful uh, logistics team, including Joseph Matai, uh, Nabajit Malakar in India, uh, also, Esha, Shadouri, Priyanka, Kular. This is our, our action aid crew um, in India. Plus, Frida Mazwi and Harare, uh, Julio Kambanko here in Brazil, uh, who have uh, been on the background uh, putting this all together. Thank you so much. It has been a wonderful uh, professional job um, week in and week out that you have undertaken here. And, and made this possible. Thanks also. Uh, we'll uh, be back uh, next year with a lively schedule. Unless there's anything else from Lynn and from Praveen. Uh, do you have anything else to add, Praveen? Lynn? No, we thank all the participants as well who have been with us uh, all through uh, in the Zoom meeting and on Facebook. And we look forward to their inputs on how do we take it forward to the next stage and so on for our different activities. So in due course, please do remain uh, engaged with us and keep uh, guiding us, keep uh, giving us your inputs. We really appreciate that. Thank you. And thank you to thank the you. chief organizer, which is Paris. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Praveen. Thank you all who have been watching us. Uh, we'll see you again next year. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for a great job, comrades, for steering us all through. Fantastic job. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>